All right, I think we're ready to go. So again, sorry for the... Um, waste of time. Um, so what we're going to do, uh, what we did last time, this is the file that uh, we worked with last time, September 2nd. We're going to work on it a little bit more. I have a few more things I want to talk about regarding basic HTML. And then what we're going to do is go right into uh, the next gear to see what we can accomplish to get us closer to the goal of uh, the, the web app that I mentioned last time. As a very quick recap again, uh, if you want to make a note or if you're new today, you can see the example of what we're going to end up on this website. On this website, vmcampos.com, SDCE. This is the example site that we're going to end up with. It's still a, a long way from what we did last time and what we'll do for the first part of today. But by the end of the first, by the end of today, we will be much closer to this goal. You see that when you go to that example site, vmcampus.com, maybe it'll be slow because we're all trying to access it. Here we go. Once you get past that, and you go to the mobile site, this is what we're going to end up with. This mobile friendly website, which in part one of this class this month, this is what our goal will be to put together a, a, a website, a mobile friendly website with real content, etc. Uh, you should explore it on your own. Then, on the next month, we're going to take this and turn it into a full fledged uh, Android app, which accesses, for example, the camera of your device and the GPS and the contacts and text messaging and vibration, all of the stuff that a mobile device can do. So if you're new today, you're not going to need an Android device until next month. And even when we get to that part of the class, you're not going to need a, a real one either. You can use virtual devices. We'll be able to run a virtual device on our, on our uh, computer, but you won't need one until next time. So uh, what we did last time, I would recommend, um, that was last last time. I'm going to change the name of that just to say September 4th so that I have a, a copy of uh, last times where, where I ended at a certain point, September 2nd, and now I'm going to work with September 4th, today's project. So we used a certain um, code editor. There is a hundreds of them, no doubt, to edit HTML and a variety of code, which is the one I recommend in this class. Notepad++ if you're on Windows and if you're on the Mac. Text Wrangler, or there's many others you can use as well. But so here we've got the September fourth uh, file. Uh, I've got mine on the desktop. You want to right-click it, and we have Edit with Notepad plus plus. So go ahead and right-click it. Edit with Notepad plus plus. We'll continue to work. Remember this uh, this text editor is nice. I like how it works. Uh, but it's not perhaps like a, um, a code editor you might be used to in that you write some code and then you see the results right away. You have to uh, go through the workflow of writing some code, saving it, and then running it. Remember? So two days ago was a long time ago. I don't even remember how this looks like. Let's uh, get a quick preview of what this looks like again. Remember? Let's go to, write, uh, let's go to Run Menu. And I'm going to be selecting Firefox just because it's the first one on the top. You can go with Chrome if you want, uh, anything you like, but I'm going to be going with Firefox as it's, it's the first one at the top. This is what the project looks like so far. So obviously this is a bit of a distance from this, which will have a shadows and um, pop-up windows and navigation <laughs> bars and all of that cool stuff. But we need to uh, do the basics before we could do the advanced. So let's continue with a little bit more based on what we did last time. Uh, what was uh, the last thing we did, the last concept we did uh, on the project last time? Anyone remember? Uh, style. Style sheets, yes. More specifically? Rounded corners. 
the, the border radius, the rounded corners around this. This is a square picture, but with a little bit of CSS, we made it into a round picture. No need to take it into Photoshop or fireworks or, or whatever. We, we, uh, we did the work, we did the editing in, in, uh, in the code. What line number did we make it round at? Well, everyone might differ a little bit, but mine is line 18. That's where I've got the image, and at the end of the line, that's where we've got some style, some CSS, and border dash radius is what specifically makes this round. And I had a nice question last time. A few of you that are a little bit more uh, experienced, the question was about should we be doing inline styling? Should we do CSS inline? Which, if you don't know what that means, is we've added the CSS style to this particular line, and we see that it works. But technically, and for myself, I wouldn't do it this way. There are more efficient ways. Remember I touched on the idea last time that if I write all of my CSS on this particular document here and then link it to all of these other documents, I can more efficiently edit this document and it will apply to every other document, right? So the way we're doing it is just to get the point across about, yes, we can edit content uh, pretty easily through this inline method, but it's not the best way. We'll look at better ways a little later. Uh, to further <coughs> work with some CSS, uh, we can also, uh, we've seen that we can do roundness here. We can, we can give uh, boxes uh, rounded corners and such. Well, uh, here's another little bit of CSS trick we can do. As I was alluding to last time, we can actually add drop shadow to just about any element in the document. So uh, let's write a little bit of CSS here that gives you a drop shadow. Let's continue on line 18. After the border radius, remember we can have many properties of this attribute. We've got width, semicolon, border radius, semicolon, and as many as we want. So, this one, add a space, this one is box-shadow, colon, semicolon. So over here, I said width, and then a value, border radius, and then a value. I need to do the same thing with box shadow, but this one's a little more complicated. Whereas I said all four corners of my border give it a radius of 200. Here I have to specify a few things when I talk about a drop shadow. So, well, first of all, the drop shadow. See my hand here? There's a shadow behind it. Notice if I get my hand closer to the screen, the shadow is a little bit more behind my hand. And as I go out further, it's a little bit more offset, right? Uh, we need to specify that. Um, we need to specify that within this box shadow property. So let's start like this. We'll say 5px space 5px. What that's saying is move the box, move the shadow over five pixels to the right and five pixels down. Then we need to say, well, how blurry of a shadow do we want? Because if I bring my hand close to the screen, it's a very sharp shadow. But as I go away further from the screen, it becomes blurrier. So here I also add a pixel value. Let's do just 5px also. And at the moment here, basically white light is, is hitting my hand, so I get a dark shadow. But if red light were hitting my hand, I would have a red shadow. And we can do that here with this code. So we can, let's start off with black. We're going to make a black drop shadow. So notice these extra parameters were necessary for this property for it to fully work. So let's save this. and then run Firefox. See, they have to use a little 
shadow right there. Question? Yes. Yeah, is it, I mean, the picture doesn't get destroyed. <coughs> the shadow enters into the picture. That's right. Nothing is being done to the picture itself. This is an element that goes outside of the picture. Question. What was the third five scans? One was right, one was left, and one Okay, the first one is, is X offset, the second one is Y offset, and the third one is how blurry to make the shadow. So for fun, let's give it an, a higher x offset. Well, I'll explain what that means exactly in a moment, but we're moving it 15 pixels to the right instead. And then I'm going to try 25 pixels down. And then for fun, I'll do a white shadow. There it is. I pushed uh, the shadow further to the right and down, kept the same amount of blur, and then uh, added a white color. So this is, uh, the first value is to the right, and then second is down. If I wanted to make the shadow on the top right of the graphic, what would my values be here? Negative? We could possibly put negative, but on which value? The second one. So I'm going to try that. Positive 15, negative 25. There it is. It's above. So, okay, that's interesting. Now, what if we put 0, 0, 5 p pixels? Let's give it a try. 0. Possibly. Let's put 0, 0. Notice I didn't put the px. We'll put 0 and 0 and then 5 pixels. Look at that, a little glow, a little halo around the element. So with 0, 0, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not pushing the shadow over or down. I'm keeping it right behind the object. And maybe if I want to see it even more, I can put a larger blur value there. even more of a blur. So positive values of this first number here, the, the x value, move to the right. Negative, move to the left. Negative 55 px. And so it moves over to the left. So that's cool. We don't have to get into the uh, Photoshop or anything like that. We can do it from, um, from all from CSS, right? And um, it works pretty well. Again, this is a um, if you're if you've done some uh, web design before, you might think, well, I've kind of heard about this before. Oh, also, quick note here: no printing, please, while the lecture is going on. That thing is loud. Um, so if you've used CSS3 before, uh, you might have heard of vendor prefixes, which is, OK, right now I'm using the standard code box shadow. But if I'm using um, an older version of a web browser, it might not work. So I would have to have a vendor prefix, meaning for Firefox web browsers, this is the code. For Google Chrome web browsers, this is the code. For Internet Explorer browsers, this is the code. I'm not going to bo bother with those because uh, at a certain point, what's the point of supporting really old technology? People might still use it. They might need to use it. They might want to use it, yes. But to be shackled down to old standards, I think, holds you back from, from innovation. And again, this is icing on the cake. This drop shadow looks nice but it's not mission critical to my website or app. If it is mission critical, 
uh, you could do it in a variety of other ways, adding the vendor prefixes, prefixes for example, or going back to the good old-fashioned way of designing it in Photoshop. But for us, we're going to use the modern code because eventually we're going. This project is going to end up in a mobile device. This project is not going to have Firefox 2.0, the mobile device. I mean, the mobile device is not going to have Chrome 6.1. It's not going to have Internet Explorer 7. It's going to have the most modern versions of the browsers of the of the of the software. Could, could you tell us what those three parameters are? In Sure. The first one is X offset. The second is Y offset. And the third is blur. Blur. So what does the 15 PX do? The 15 PX? Well, what happens if you make it really small? What happens if you make it really big? A lot of blur, a lot of drop shadow. So that's what that does. It gives you more drop shadow. But it doesn't change the intensity of the shadow? No, actually, the intensity of the shadow is dependent on your color. So I have white here, so it's just white. But I'm able to also put in here um, RGB colors. Remember, we played with that a bit. So we can change colors that way as well. And we can also add transparency to a color. Like this. I'll show you what I did in a moment. You can't really see it here, but it's a little it's a little transparent. That's the intensity. So look what I did here. We've seen the RGBA method last time where we mixed red, green, and blue. But now this is another CSS3 construct. I've got RGBA. A is for alpha or transparency. So if we write this, let's give this a try. Instead of just having a very basic color, let's write this. Let's write RGBA the parentheses <coughs> technically don't don't need it but no, i should between do the, uh, between here yeah. yeah no space here so we have rgba and we have the r which is red green blue and then one more comma and one more value, and this is alpha, this is transparency. Think of it going from 0 to 1, or percent, right? 0 0.9 is like 90%. 0 0.5 is like 50%. 1 is 100%. So whatever color I mixed with RGB, then the fourth value makes it transparent or, or, or changes the intensity but it mixes with the background. You might not see a big difference. I put 0.5. So the transparency is just 0 to 1? That's right. So you can do 0 0.1, 0 0.19, 0 to 1. If you did 0, no, it would be an invisible color because we forced it to have some form of transparency. So it goes away. Yeah. Yeah, let me make it more obvious. Let me make a green color. Okay, there's green, but I put it on zero, so it's totally transparent. And then there's one fully opaque. There it is. Question. Mm -hmm. Opacity or alpha. Same term. They call it alpha here, but you can think about it as opacity. Is there a way to do that using text numbers? I don't believe so. We can look it up. Don't quote me. There probably is now that I think about it. But um, 
I think this is one of the easier ways to do it because a lot of us have a hard time thinking in hex or hex colors. But here it makes a lot more sense. RGB, 0 to 255, makes a color. All right, so we did a little bit more art, uh, a little bit more CSS3 tricks here. There's, of course, many more that we can do. This is one of the things I forgot to say last time. Well, I'm giving you all this information. It seems like I know it all, uh, but I don't. That's the secret. I don't know it all, but I know where to look it up. Let me show you where I would look up more information about CSS, HTML, all of this cool stuff. If you go to your web browser, let me first show you this one. This is called um, CSS3, uh, CSS3.info. Yes, CSS3.info. This is a website that focuses on uh, what's, what's happening with CSS3, the CSS3 standard. What are the what's the state of things? What's the code? What are examples? What does it do? The site itself is also built on CSS3. For example, those tabs at the top there, they have rounded corners like we did. They have actually transparency. Notice that I can see the rainbow behind it. And then other, other things. So CSS3.info, you can go here and look at the CSS3 preview or the module stats. And uh, if you go to the preview, for example, Tell me everything about border radius. So if you go there, what I showed you was one of the many things you could do about border radius. What I showed was that if you add border radius and only one value, it adds the border radius to all four corners. You can actually add specific amounts of roundness to all four corners. Like this. Border dash top dash left dash radius, 10px, 5px. So the top left corner will have its own bit of radiusness. And then the bottom right, you can also do percentages, apparently. And the top left, the top right, and you get these different shapes that are not just uniform. See here? If this is border top left, 50 pixels, it's a uniform 50. If you go 100 and and then 50, notice how much of a curve there is along the x value, left and right. If you do 50 and 100, there's more of a curve uh, on the y value, up and down. So you can have these exactly modified corners uh, by giving the exact border, uh, border radius value. And it goes into a lot of detail. And then it talks about those vendor prefix prefixes like I mentioned. Perhaps an old version of Firefox, like version 3.5, is not compatible with the one I just showed you. Again, how many are running version 3.5? They're on version like 29 at the moment. So I'm not quite worried about old browsers. Here's examples. Look at that. You can make that in pure CSS instead of designing that in Photoshop. <clears throat> Here's the code for that one, example D. Yes? Yes, but uh, be careful. If you copy the whole thing here, that's too much. All you need is just where it says border radius, okay. and then your values. Question? EM is another unit of measurements. It's like percentages, but um, we'll, we'll actually use percent most of the time, and then we'll look at M in a moment, but they, they're a relative unit of measurement. We'll see exactly how it works a little bit later, but I would recommend either percentages or Ms as your units, not pixels, not inches, not centimeters. Those are the things that don't change, but Ms and percentages do. Okay, so CSS3.info is one place. Any, any questions on this site? 
The other site that I recommend, and there's a thousand others that I'm not going to mention, but this is another one that you can check out. It's w3schools.com. w3schools.com This is a great website that has a lot of free tutorials on just about every web language. It has HTML, it has CSS, JavaScript, PHP, ASP, all these TLAs. You know what TLA stands for? three-letter acronym. You're going to see a lot of TLAs on the web. www, PHP, CSS. So if you go to w3schools.com, you start a tutorial on learning CSS, on JavaScript, jQuery, PHP. What's also cool here is this is where you would go to find the list of all possible HTML colors. Remember, we, we played with blue and yellow and goldenrod and azure. There's a bunch of them here that I didn't get to. If you go to W3Schools and go to the references, you look it up right here, HTML colors. And here's a list of all 140 of them. Cornflower blue. Dark slate blue, honeydew, etc. Turquoise, thistle. Hmm. Snow. And what I also like here is let's say you find a nice color like turquoise. And what you could do then is is get shades of it and, or do or mix it, just like they do at the uh, Home Depot. So let's say I'm going to start with tomato, actually. And I can go to mix. And then I guess select uh, some colors here. So it blends those colors. And there's my perfect color right there. P2478, that's the color you would find. It's no longer blue or yellow or purple. It has to be that <coughs> color combination. And you would just copy that number for Exactly. So that one is pound 732E7D. So I go over to my background color, and instead of having this, it's not an RGB color anymore, actually. You would write it exactly how it tells you there. Pound 732E7D. There's the color. So there's many ways to write uh, colors in HTML. The, obviously the easiest way is look at one of the 140 colors to choose from and just write its name. That might not be your color. So you need the color formula. We saw we could do it via RGB, mixing red, green, blue. And then we've got this one which is hexadecimal, which is kind of difficult to work with because you're thinking in base 16 and it's complicated. But if you get the color formula for it, you just plug it in where necessary and it applies. Is one faster than another? Do you have lots of colors on the website? Is one going to be more efficient to use? I guess very, very technically, perhaps hexadecimal because it's only six bytes, whereas RGB could be a few more bytes. But you know, six bytes compared to nine bytes. But if you've got a thousand different colors, I guess it might add up technically. But this is such an inf infinitesimal value that I don't really think there's much of a speed difference. All right, so here's what we've got so far. Uh, let's work a little bit more with CSS. Remember last time 
will be for that. Any questions so far? Everyone on the right track? Everyone's code looks good? Yes? In terms of formatting on the screen, you, you said that if you hit enter, that doesn't mm -hmm. default. Is there, is there a standard, like on, on our image line, we've got a really long line. Is, it, is there a standard to sort of put in some carriage returns to sort of break it up? No, not at all. It's up to you to decide how you want to break it up. Because technically, all of these 26 lines could be one long line. Not necessary to break it up. Uh, it's just up to you to break it up. Uh, I do see when we do more complicated things like JavaScript where there's many commands within commands, it, then it's a good idea to break it up line by line just to read it. But, but you don't put each, each parameter on its own line. You could actually. I could break it up like this. I could put a style over here, just kind of tab it to look indented, and then bring this over here like that. And I could put each parameter on its own line. But that's not really a standard thing about standards is when it comes to programming, there's few languages that tell you you have to do these carriage return and you have to do these spaces. This one is very forgiving. So for an in-house standard, let's say your company, this could be the standard and it'll work. <laughs> Question? Your you had your comment, you just triple, double, slash. Okay, let's do that, actually. That was a good point. So some of you that have more experience in commenting your code, I'll show you how to do that now. If you've never heard of that, well, right now what we're going to do is all of this code that we write, the web browser translates it and then shows it uh, as a web page. Well, it's a good idea to use co uh, comments in our code uh, either to sort of leave ourselves notes about this works like this or this means that, and what a comment is, it'll be ignored by the web browser. So many programming languages have different ways to do it. Here's how we can do it in, um, in HTML. And the confusing thing is that there's actually three different ways to do it. Uh, here's the, the first way we'll, we'll see. Let's add a comment to explain what line 6 is doing. Um, so let's go above line 6, which is the body tag. Give yourself a new line, an empty new line there. We're going to start this uh, comment tag. It does have a beginning and an end, but it's weird. First, we're going to start with the less than symbol, of course. And then we're going to do an exclamation point and two dashes and then a space. Did you notice everything turned green? We just commented the whole page out. If we were to save and run it, it would be blank. Well, we need the closing tag. The closing tag is close to that, it's dash dash greater than. No exclamation point, no slash. So that's an HTML comment tag. And it's actually multi-line. So I can write some comments here. That'll work. Or I can put in a bunch of comments in the middle, like that, as long as it's within these two uh, as long as it's within these two <coughs> tags. Uh, I don't remember if you need a space there, but I usually put one. Put the starting tag space, your comments, space ending tag. But the point is, what we're going to do is, we're going to write a comment here. The web browser will ignore this. It won't process it. But this is good for when you come back to your project a month later, and you forget, what did this code do again? This loop does something, but what does it do? Uh, we, we're just going to say... Um, we've changed, or I've changed, we've changed the body style to purple. Body style background color. You can be as detailed as you want. No one, um, well, the web browser doesn't process this. Uh, this could be for yourself to leave yourself notes to explain yourself within the code. What does it do? If you're working with a team, these are good to tell your team members this is why this works or fix this. Yes? 
Anywhere, actually. So if you want to um, go to IMG here, or HR, what does HR do again? Mix a line. So I'm going to add a comment above the HR. So same thing. Technically, it does show up if you look at the source code, but the web browser doesn't process it. Yeah, use them, use them as, as best as you. Yeah, you can ask your fellow programmers questions about how would you possibly do that. Yeah, you can use uh, CSS styling to edit the HR as well. Change its width, change its height, background color. The uh, CSS can style just about everything in our in our document. That's a cool thing, even a plain old HR. So this is the comment. You can add it anywhere you want, except within a tag. So if you want to, if if this. I had it instead inside of IMG. I found that there's problems. So I put a tag in. I put the comment tag inside of a tag. That one I found problems. So I would say put it before or after your code or next to it. You can also do it like this. That way, it might make more sense. This comment relates to that line. If I have it above. I might think, does it apply to the top tag or the bottom tag? All right, so this is what we've got so far. Uh, let's do a little bit more CSS. And then we'll start to see CSS, on the one hand, is really great. But on the other hand, you might hate it. The reason is you are able to control every aspect of the, of the design with CSS. But CSS is like a puzzle. And isn't it terrible when you're about to build a puzzle and there's one piece missing? So a lot of what CSS is is interlocking, that this works because of that. Basically, this document right here has inherent styling. It's a white background, black text. So when I start to add some CSS that says make the background yellow, okay, everything becomes yellow. But then I say make everything in this cell blue, we're overriding a previous behavior. And sometimes that conflicts. So we're going to run into an issue in a moment where I'm going to make some styling and it's going to look how I want, but then it's going to conflict with something else, and then we get into those issues, and I'll show you how to deal with them. What I want to do here is notice how everything is to the left. Again, that's the default behavior. Everything text aligned to the left. In Word or any word processor, I can put in the I can put everything in the center or to the right, or I can justify my text. I can do that in CSS as well. I want to center all my text. So what we'll do is let's go to line back to line seven. And we're going to edit the style of body again. I want everything in the document affected. So uh, I go back to the larger element, right? Um, H1 is inside of body. So if I control body, I control everything inside of body. If I go a level higher, the HTML tag, I control every element there as well. So it's like um, those are Russian nesting dolls that you've got a little one inside of a bigger one, inside of a bigger one, inside of a bigger one. So if I edit the bigger one, it affects the smaller one. Kind of the same thing here. HTML is the biggest doll, and then as we go deeper, body is a smaller one, and then H1 is a smaller one inside of that. P is on the same level as H1, but I could have something inside of P. Levels. So let's go back to the higher level of body. We've currently got background color and color, which is text color. 
Let's add another one. So after text color here, let's add text dash align space semicolon. Remember again, the way I do it is when I have a pair of things, write the pair, then the details. So I do this just to not forget that semicolon because if I forget that and add more properties, it could probably break the whole site. Text align. And here we have pretty easily center text align. Make the alignment of my text center. Okay, that makes sense. All the text will be centered. Let's check it out. Save it and run it. Ooh, all my text is... Wait a minute. Why did, that, why did the top text not center? This is what I'm saying about the puzzle. It's all interlocking. Before we started to edit the default behavior of H1, it would have obeyed. What did we do with H1? We shortened the line. We gave it width of 75. So even that then, now it stopped paying attention to the earlier rule. Even though we didn't explicitly, even though we don't seem to explicitly say to ignore it, it does. So everything centered, even the picture, even the horizontal ruler, horizontal rule, everything aligned to the center except the H1. So we'll deal with that in a moment. But note that text align even affects um, pictures. So there's a variety of ways to fix this. Question. Yes. Is the background color on the body H1? So the body would be overriding the background color. Yes. Yes. So the body would be overriding H1? No, it's backwards. The H1 will override the body. It basically goes from top to bottom. That's what CSS is, cascade, like a waterfall. What's at the top takes precedence to what's at the bottom. Technically, what's inside of something else takes precedence. So body is affecting everything, but then H1 is inside a body, and it's only affecting H1. So it takes over. OK, so we want this to get centered. We'll, um, we'll try it this way. Um, on, on the syllabus, for example, um, you've got an equal amount of space on all four sides of the document. We've got a top, a right, a bottom, and a left on our, on our syllabus, right? You notice I, I set it that way and clockwise. Top, right, bottom, left. In websites, we think about it the same way. The, the web browser here, it also has a, a top, a right, a bottom, and a left. Clockwise. Top, right, bottom, left. Memorize that. We are able to affect all four sides of any element, and you'll do good to remember top, right, bottom, left. So this text at the top is perfectly aligned because there's an equal amount of space on the left and the right. Let's say two inches. There's two inches here, two inches here, so it's centered because my sheet is eight and a half inches wide. If I go horizontal, now I have an 11-inch size document, so I'm going to need 3 inches of space on the left and the right. And then the text would get centered. We are going to do something like that here, but we don't have the luxury to, to know how big the screen is. So we'll do this trick. We'll say we're going to affect the margins of the left and the right of that H1 in a way that will automatically take up the space it needs. So let's continue. Okay, let's go to line 8, where we've got the h1. And after the width, let's add margin, colon, semicolon. And remember I said, um, top, right, bottom, left, four values. 
let's try this. Let's say, just bear with me, 25px space, 25px space, 25px space, 25px. So margin, colon, space, 25px space, four times, top, right, bottom, left. I'm going to put 25 pixels of space at the top, 25 pixels on the right, 25 pixels on the left, uh, on the bottom I mean, the bottom, and 25 on the left, clockwise. See how that looks. Here's before and after. Before, look at how close it is to the left. After, 25 pixels pushed over from the left. A little bit from the top, a little bit at the bottom. Negligible on the right because it's so far from the right, but you definitely see it on the left, correct? So just to be more obvious, 125, 125, 125. that it pushed it from the top to 125, from the right 125, from the bottom, from the left. So just like here, I can affect all four sides. If I write, if I write the four values. Question? Uh, going back to the huh. why isn't the body we didn't specify any special rules for H2, so it's just going to inherit the last rule. But this one is only affecting itself, not everything below it, literally. This style is only affecting H1, and it's overriding the style we said before it. This one didn't have any special style, so it's just going to go back and inherit the larger containers properties, not the one above it. So that's a little confusing. Sorry about that. It's going to affect. It's going to go back to the containers properties, not the one literally above it. Okay. So these four values that we added here were for all four sides. And here's the cool thing about CSS: we can do a shorthand. If we say all four values, it will affect all four sides of the, of, the, of the box around the element. Try this and then check it. I won't tell you what it does yet, but try this. Try to have only two values here. Save it and run it. What's the difference? If you put two values, it's a trick question, it looks the same. Well, what if you change those values? I'm going to try for the first value, 225. So this is the thing about any programming language, just about anything you learn. Um, try it, especially with programming. There's usually a control Z. There's usually a way to take back the last thing that you did. So a way to learn things is to try them, make mistakes, and undo the mistake, especially if you have something digital to work with. You know, I've been doing uh, computer work and web design, graphic design, and websites for a long time. And a few years ago, I took a, a painting class with oil paintings, oil paints, and I really liked it. And there was at least one time that I remember I was on the canvas painting something, and I really felt I could have pressed Control Z because I was so used to Photoshop. Make a mistake, Control Z. But no, this is oil painting. You just cover it up and keep going. But here in programming, uh, I don't know what that did. Undo it. Move on. It's okay to make mistakes. But if you change that first value you should see that the top and the bottom were affected. Now it's got 225 pixels at the top and at the bottom, and still 125 at the left and the right. So this shorthand is a way to quickly add a value to the top and the bottom 
of an element. The first value affects the top and bottom. The second value affects the left and the right. So this is both top and bottom, and this is both left and right. That's right. It's the box around the text. So the width of 75% is the is the text is the box behind the text. Not the text. We can affect that with another property, uh, font size or text size or something. We can change the size of the text in a different way. Right now we're affecting the box behind the text. Every element here actually has an invisible box behind it. We don't see the box until we, until we add a background color. Question? About the phone? Well, I, we're not quite done yet here, and this will answer that question in a moment. Yeah. The uh, the thing that we're doing here, just as a proof of concept, we're using hard pixel values, which previously I said we should avoid. Remember, I said don't make it 150 pixels wide your box. Make it 75 percent. So right now I'm just showing you that with pixel values is what we get, but we we uh, there's better ways to do it. Uh, we'll do it better way one more in in one moment. But let me show one more way. We saw that we can write four values to affect all four sides of the box. We can write two values to affect two at a time. If you write one value, that applies it to all four sides. So when we deal with margin, we're dealing with four sides of a box, always, even if it's invisible. If we say four values, it's the four sides. Two values, top and bottom, left and right, always in that order. The first value is top and bottom. The second value is left and right. One value affects everything at once. And what I'm getting at is we were able to put values here, and maybe this looks nice and centered on this screen. But if it were this size screen, it's not centered. And if it were this size screen, it's not centered. So a better way, in this case, we'll write the value auto, A-O-U-T. Margin auto. Save it and run it. Centered. So this is what I'm saying about CSS is very powerful, but quickly it can get complicated. Something as simple as I did text align and everything aligned. Why did that other text not align? Because the CSS further down affected it and broke it away from paying attention to the larger value. Okay, so we'll center it. Great, we can center it on, on a known size. We're not going to deal with known sizes on websites, even on mobile devices. You know, there's 3-inch sized Android devices, there's 4-inch, there's 5-inch, there's tablets. So we have to deal with things in a different way. Yes? I was wondering, if you, can you, if you can't comment, like somewhere within these brackets, so just like show, like, if you want me to note to yourself, this is how you, you, know, you you put in the, the four, the four parts. Yeah, I don't, I don't believe so. Uh, it's gonna get confused if you put the, if you put the, the item there. I believe because there's gonna be an angle bracket, it's gonna get confused with that angle bracket, and it doesn't quite work. So, best case is that you put it next to the line or above the line or someplace close, and hopefully your 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 comment makes sense. Okay. <coughs> You could. You should try it and let me know. 
so uh, margin auto then does what I wanted. It automatically put an equal amount of space actually on all four sides because I had one value. And then again for fun, we can do 25px space auto. What that will do is 25 pixels at the top and bottom and then automatically left and right. So 25 top and bottom, automatic left and right. Not with, uh, well, there is a center, and I have to look up when is the right time to use it, but you can add the value center in some cases. And the thing is that there's many ways to skin the digital cat, because we can add, we can do this in a variety of ways. This is one way, there's other ways to do it too. Um, whatever works for the project is a good idea. Okay, so uh, let's take our first break, short break, and when we come back we'll, we'll, we'll move further. It's about 7.15, let's take a 10 minute break, we'll be back at 7.25, uh, and we'll go on.